At the beginning of the New World, we were told that the marines under Akainu were now even more powerful than ever before. A very exciting prospect that began to seem like a lie as the New World progressed. It just didn't make any sense. The marines had to be weaker than ever. Garp and Sengoku, the two greatest marines of all time, had retired. Aokiji, who was nearly equal to Akainu, had left. And his replacement, Green Bull, didn't exactly seem all that impressive when a Yonko came rolling around. And on top of all that, the Marines had lost the Shichibukai, who were supposedly essential to the Marines maintaining their edge over the Pirate Emperors. And considering how ridiculously strong Luffy has become and the sheer number of allied forces that are beginning to accumulate on his side, it actually was starting to seem like the deck was stacked against the world government heading into the final war. But with the reveal of the Seraphim, all of that has changed, and it turns out that the world government and the marines are in fact undoubtedly stronger than ever before. This addition by Oda of pacifistas that are in fact pseudo Shichibukai seems like one of the absolute best decisions to drastically ramp up the stakes of the final war. And today we're going to be looking at how this revamps the playing field of the world powers and the potential matchups we could be getting down the line. Before we get into it, make sure to subscribe and make sure to save yourself some time with Factor, the sponsor for this video. If you don't like cooking at all, you don't even wanna to touch a single ingredient, you don't want to waste a single second of your life at the grocery store or over a hot stove, then you need to be using Factor, especially if you've been ordering too much takeout these days. Factor makes it easy to eat healthy with zero effort by delivering fresh, nutritious meals straight to your door that genuinely taste good. The food is prepared by chefs and it's never frozen, so you know you're eating right and you don't have to waste time at the grocery store or cooking for hours on end. No thought required, no guesswork, just tasty, healthy meals ready to go delivered straight to you. In general, Factors made it way easier for me and my work schedule, since no matter how late I might be streaming, I never have to worry about having a good meal ready to eat right after. So head to go.factor75.com slash morge130 and use code morge130 to get $130 off six boxes. Link in the description below. So that aside, the most important reason that the Seraphim change everything is because they are better than the Shichibukai. Note, this does not mean I'm saying that they are stronger than the Shichibukai. I doubt that they are stronger than the originals, although this sword feat by the Mihawk Seraphim is exactly the type of thing we would expect to see from Mihawk himself, so it's hard to say just how strong they are exactly. But even if we temper our expectations and assume that they're not quite as strong as the original Shichibukai, they are still infinitely more effective assets for the world government than the original Shichibukai ever were. Because looking back at the Marine Ford War now, with all of the information we have, it is more clear than ever that the Shichibukai really put in less than the bare minimum effort. If the Shichibukai, all five of them, had genuinely tried during Marine Ford, then it wouldn't have ever been a war, it would have been a massacre of the Whitebeard Pirates. Looking at Mihawk alone, we know that his full strength in a sword fight is above even Shanks. Yet he was repeatedly stopped in his tracks by characters like Vista and Jozu. Knowing how strong Emperor caliber fighters actually are and what we would expect someone of that level to do to mere commanders, I think that the amount that Mihawk was holding back during Marine Ford is pretty much impossible to even put into words. It would be like the equivalent of someone being half asleep. Not to mention Doflamingo treating the war like a joke, Hancock actively sabotaging the world government, Really the only Shichibukai trying there was Moria, and he was deemed too weak to even be a member of the Shichibukai in the first place. The actual big guns of the group just did not try at all. In theory, the Shichibukai as a collective group are an absolutely ridiculous powerhouse to have on the world government's side. I've said this in past videos, but the Shichibukai altogether are essentially like a Yonko crew. Mihawk himself is an emperor caliber fighter, and characters like Doflamingo, Hancock, and Kuma are certainly comparable to any Yonko's top commanders. But while in theory it's like the world government had a Yonko empire level force that they could simply call on for aid, in actuality the Shichibukai were a fickle and inconsistent group, some of whom did not put in full effort, some of whom refused to even help, and some of whom even outright betrayed the world government. Now on the one hand, yes that made the balance of power interesting for the early half of the story, in that ultimately this was meant to be a delicate dynamic where on paper the world government has far more firepower than any individual Yonko Empire, 
because they have the Shichibukai on their side, but at the same time, in reality, the Shichibukai are more of a wild card than anything. As it turned out, the existence of the Shichibukai as a deterrent for the Yonko was all that they were really useful for, as at the end of the day, they really did not impact the Marine Forward War that heavily. Unless you count the impact they had in screwing the world government over, in which case their impact was really high. However, with the introduction of the Seraphim, we now get the actual answer to the exciting question of, what if the Shichibukai actually were on the world government side? What would things look like if all of these ridiculously strong pirates actually fought alongside the marines? That is absolutely what is needed going into the final war, because going into the final conflict of any story, you always want the stakes to be higher than ever. You always want the villains, the antagonists to be stronger than ever. If before this, the Shichibukai were an interesting concept as a force that the Marines kind of sort of had on their side, but to an ambiguous degree, a setup that added to the idea of a delicate balance to the world, now is the point in the story where the time for balance is over. Now is the time where we want full-scale wars between fully powered forces, because the good guys side between the revolutionaries, the straw hats, the fleets, kid, law, the allied nations, the good guys side is about to be ridiculously stacked. And with the last several snippets we've gotten of the Marines repeatedly showing them as being on the back foot, with the Kainu continually talking about how they don't have the manpower for this or that, or how things are going wrong everywhere, and again, Green Bull's embarrassing retreat not helping matters whatsoever, the reveal of the long-awaited and long-hyped Seraphim was much, much needed to firmly swing the pendulum back over to the world government side, to remind us that yes, this is still the strongest force on the seas, with the most resources. And what an introduction we got for them. Riding off the recent Mihawk hype from just one chapter ago, Oda doubled down on it by showing the world government replicating his power to some degree, such that it's even got an emperor shocked and sweating. And the exciting thing about the Seraphim is we have no idea how far this new development goes. First of all, they are children at the moment. Is that the plan or are they not yet at full strength? Are they still maturing? After all, these are new inventions. Could we be seeing an adult version of them in the final battle? Can they replicate devil fruit abilities? Could Hancock's terrifying ability that was hyped up this chapter be used by her Seraphim counterpart? Sure, we know that Kuma's clones could not use his devil fruit abilities, but that was just the old pacifista models. Who's to say that the Seraphim are bound by those same restrictions? We already know mimicking devil fruit abilities is possible with technology, as proven by the fact that the pacifista's lasers are in fact copies of Kizaru's lasers. And how many of the Shichibukai were copied into Seraphim exactly? Just the most recent batch? Or are we going to get to see Crocodile and Blackbeard models as well? Maybe even Trafalgar Law? Not to mention, Mihawk Seraphim was able to cut a mountain. Was that through the use of Haki? Can the Seraphim use Haki? And that's not even getting into the broken Lunarian abilities that we were just introduced to through King. I don't think it's unreasonable to think that the Seraphim are about to have those abilities as well, considering their designs indicate there is very clearly Lunarian blood in the mix. That's likely why Oda has spent so much time recently between Punk Hazard, Whole Cake Island, and Wano focusing on these bloodline abilities and all of these experiments that are being used across the world to create special soldiers by various groups. All of it leading up to justifying the creation of these ridiculously overpowered Seraphim as the world government's trump cards. And I think by far the most important avenue the Seraphim open up in the story is final matchups. That was one thing that was getting to be a big question mark as the final war with the world government began to get closer. Who the hell is everyone going to fight? Because one of the major reasons many readers weren't that excited about all of the talk of SSG early on was because first of all, simple and fair skepticism of the idea that some science experiment could replace the Shichibukai. But beyond that, most of the guesses I was seeing among readers regarding the SSG and what that was, was that it was going to be some sort of mass force of advanced fodder. What do I mean by that? What am I saying when I say advanced fodder? Well, if we look at what the world government was experimenting with before this, we had the pacifistas. We had the oars sized giants. Beyond that, from other science groups throughout the world, we were seeing things like clone armies that the Germa would produce, or the gifters that Kaido was creating. Basically, a lot of the technological advancements in the One Piece world by these various groups tended to be focusing on making armies of soldiers that are stronger than normal soldiers. And sure, at one point, a single pacifista was a huge threat, but at this point, not really. And that's kind of the general problem that comes with the idea of hyping up the creation of armies of advanced fodder, which is that sure, 
On paper, they are technically a big challenge, but when you're actually reading the story, it's hard to feel like it really matters. Like, did it really feel like the gifters were that much of a problem during the Onigashima War? Would it really have mattered if Kaido had some more numbers on his side? Generally, I never really feel like these technological leaps in producing better armies really matter that much when it comes to the really relevant parts of the conflict, since it's nice to hype up how strong the masses of the enemy forces are, but at the end of the day, we're not that interested in strong foot soldiers we're more interested in the actual high-level opponents our heroes will fight. And again, I think when most readers are discussing the SSG, a lot of the ideas being thrown around were that it would be a bunch of super-sized giants like ores, so just more numbers, essentially. Or maybe some government-produced dragons, stuff like that. Essentially, almost all guesses I saw being thrown out there was that it was going to be quantity over quality, because we all assumed that the Shichibukai as individuals couldn't be replaced. And yet, it turns out they can. They can be replaced with more obedient, more useful versions of themselves. And suddenly, that makes for a much more interesting setup. Whereas before, on the Marine side, we basically only had Akainu, Kizaru, and Green Bull as the heavy hitters. I'm not even going to count Fujitora, because literally everything about his character, his ideals, his justice, his motivations, all of that indicates that it makes no sense for him to actually side with the world government in the final war. So we basically had a Kainu, two admirals, and then a bunch of vice admirals. Which sure, could make a good fight for the Straw Hats. As I've talked about in a video you can click above my head, maybe we get the Monster Trio versus the admirals, and then the rest of the crew versus vice admirals, kind of like what we saw at Marine Ford. There would still be all of these other characters lying around that would otherwise have nothing to do, like Kid, Law, Dragon, Sabo, Yamato, Hancock, etc. The list goes on and on. There are so many strong, good guy characters that we can expect to be involved in the final war, who previously I had no idea on how they might fit, because no matter what, some characters would be getting the short end of the stick, either the Straw Hats or some side characters. But now, there are actually potentially seven or more extremely high-level opponents to go around. Now, I have no idea who is actually going to fight who, but the possibilities are certainly exciting. Could we see Law get a rematch against Doflamingo, but the Seraphim version? Maybe Hancock versus her counterpart, or maybe we get to see some of the Straw Hats go up against Seraphim. The possibilities that come out of this single addition to the story make the final war exponentially more exciting, because it indicates to me that the characters that we really want to get to see fight are not going to get shafted to the side. Since the only reason for Oda to be writing in more strong opponents for the world government side this late into the game is to make sure that there is enough action to go around. So let me know what you expect of the Seraphim in the future and what potential matchups they could lead to in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, then definitely like and subscribe. And you can support me on Patreon to get my extended thoughts on this and all future topics.